Bet you guys can't wait to get back to Genesis again, huh? <laughs> you can only spend so much time away from it before you come back to it. So we continue on with this story about Abraham and his son Isaac. So it says, when they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies, and by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men. They arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. This is the word of the Lord. So during the season of Lent, and you heard Barbara talk a little bit about that, uh, and that's the time, just so we're all clear, it's where we anticipate Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross. We're going to be taking a break from our Mark series, and if you've been here, you know what I feel like we haven't really done very much in Mark, and that's because Lent is so close this year. It's really, really early this year. And we're going to do a new series, and this series is called Here I Am. So... The series is based on a pattern that takes place in the Bible, which is God calls out to a person, and that person hears the name, and in response they say, here I am. So we're going to look at the various instances where this occurs, and then we're going to talk about how these events have relevance to our lives. And all of this will culminate in our Good Friday sermon where we will talk about Jesus when he says, here I am to God, when he suffers and dies on the cross. So today, we start with the first instance of here I am in the scriptures, and that occurs when Abraham tells, or when God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son, Isaac. Now, we talked about this, as I kind of referenced, last year when we were dealing with our Genesis series, and I told you during that series how this story relates to the Christian faith. Well, today, we're going to talk about it from a totally different kind of perspective, and in order to do that, I want to get into the story. So... God calls out to Abraham, and Abraham says, you got it, you got it, this is easy, right? No big deal. Well, that's my sermon for today, that's what we've done, that's all we need to do. So he says, here I am, and then God says back, Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and sacrifice him there on the mountains that I will show you. So let's recap what just happened, just so that we're all on the same page. God tells Abraham to take his son, to go to this mountain, and to sacrifice, to kill, to murder his son. Now, this request by God, it raises some really interesting questions about God's nature, such as, do you think this is the type of thing that God would actually ask you to do? Do you believe that God would ever ask you, request from you, that you sacrifice, that you murder your child. Now, you have to think about this because how you answer that question, it says a lot about the God who you worship. So if we take the story literally, meaning you read it and you believe this is exactly how it happened way back when God called out and asked him, well, we got to admit, that's pretty brutal, right? Because what does it say about God that God would actually ask you to sacrifice your most beloved child? I mean, on the surface of it, the whole point of this is for Abraham to prove how loyal he is to God. Not even Abraham's child can come before God. Now, is God really that insecure? I mean, I'm asking that seriously. 
Is God really that insecure? It's not enough for you to simply say God is number one. You got to prove it by actually going out and murdering your son and showing to God and the world that you mean it. Now, the last time I preached on this, I explained to you all that one of the reasons why this story is in the scripture is because the Israelites, they were surrounded by a lot of different cultures. And one of those cultures, they were known as the Canaanites. And the Canaanites, they worshipped this goddess whose name was Baal. Now Baal, she was the goddess of fertility. So she was responsible for women getting pregnant and responsible for agricultural growth. Now during times where there was severe drought or famine, it was not uncommon for villagers to sacrifice their firstborn child to Baal in order to seek relief from that drought or famine. And so this story, the way it's laid out in the Bible, right? God asks Abraham to go sacrifice his son, and then he goes out, and then at the last moment, God stops Abraham, and Abraham says what? At that point he says, here I am, right? And so the point of that is to show, the entire point of this being in there is to differentiate the God of the Israelites from the goddess Baal, and to say, and give a very clear message, that we as Israelites, we do not sacrifice our children to God. Now that's a really positive spin on a pretty rough story, right? But if we're going to take it literally, we still have this issue that God made this request of Abraham. That's the uncomfortable reality. Indeed, God only stops Abraham as he's bringing the knife down to murder his son. So what this tells you is, is that according to the story, Abraham had already flipped the switch. He was ready to go through with it. So even though God stops Abraham before the knife penetrates his son's flesh, I think we'd all have to admit that this is a pretty traumatizing experience for Abraham, right? I mean, would you agree with me on that? Now, is that the kind of God we believe in? A God who would traumatize us just so we could prove our loyalty to him? I mean, that sounds a lot more like something the mafia would do than what God would do to us, right? And so I'm going to tell you straight out, that's not the kind of God I believe in. I do not believe in a God who needs us to prove anything. So, if we're going to abandon the literal meaning of this story, then what are we left with? Well, if we take a step back and we kind of look at this story from different lens, we see that we have this guy Abraham, and he obviously believes in his own mind that he needs to do this, that he needs to sacrifice his son. And he's torn, right? because he doesn't really want to do it. He loves his son, but he wants to serve God. And so he's in this really difficult situation where he has to make a tough choice. And so perhaps this story is really a parable about how in really difficult circumstances, how do we tell when we're making the right choices? I mean, that's something that we can all relate to, right, here? You may not be able to relate to sacrificing your child, but you can certainly relate to the idea of being in a difficult situation and trying to make the right decisions. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about how do we know when we've made a decision that God would want us to make versus a decision that God would desire less? How do we know when we're walking down that path that God would want us to walk down? How do we know when we've heard God's voice and said, here I am? Now, one way that we can know whether or not we're doing this appropriately is by the consequences of our actions. So when you make a decision, that decision, it impacts the people around you. You follow me on this? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, rather than just lay all this out for you as how these consequences impact the world, I want to tell you a story. Because I think this story actually is going to give you a better sense of what I'm talking about than if I simply explained it to you. The story revolves around a man named Hisham Shahab. Hisham Shahab. So Hisham, he was born in 1960 in the country of Lebanon, and he grew up as a Muslim. Now, during the early part of his life, the country of Lebanon was a predominantly Christian country. But by 1975, the demographics in Lebanon had shifted significantly. It had come to about a 50-50 split with Christians and Muslims. And the reason why over 15 years it had changed so dramatically is because Muslims are very much like Orthodox Jews. They tend to have lots of children. Now this, in and of itself, is not a bad thing. 
But the problem was is that the government in Lebanon, it was run by Christians. And those Christians did not want to extend rights to the Muslims who were living in Lebanon. So you can understand how this would cause a great deal of tension, right? Well, this tension, it boils over on April 13th, 1975, when a bus full of Palestinian Muslims are traveling through a Christian area of Lebanon, and a Christian militia attacks the bus, fires into it, and ends up killing 30 people. Now, as a result, a Muslim militia gets together and they retaliate, killing members of this Christian militia, which ignites an entire civil war, which will last for more than 15 years and take the lives of 150,000 people. Hisham, he was a contributor to that death toll. Being 15, being Muslim, he believed that it was important for him to defend his faith. So he got a rifle, and he traversed to the top of these tall, high-rise buildings. And he would snipe members of these Christian militias. Eventually, he and his older brother, they came into possession of a mortar and shells. And they went to the outside of the city of Beirut, to these Christian neighborhoods, and they would launch these rockets into the Christian areas. And after shooting a couple of these rockets, Hisham, he stopped his brother and he said, you know what? We don't know who we're hitting with these things. We could be hitting innocent people, meaning women and children who were not associated with the Christian militias. So they took their stuff, they backed out, and Hisham, he went to the head of the Muslim Brotherhood in the city of Beirut. Now the Muslim Brotherhood, you might be familiar with them because back in 2009, during the Egyptian Revolution, they were the ones who came to power. They were the ones who were elected. Recently, the Muslim Brotherhood was taken out of power by the Egyptian government because they were oppressing their people. So this is 1975. Hisham goes to the head of the Muslim Brotherhood, and he says to him, he says, look, we're shooting these mortar rockets into these areas, and I'm concerned that they're indiscriminately hurting people. And so the head of the Muslim Brotherhood, he says to Hisham, he says, Hisham, who is your example in life? And Hisham says, well, the Prophet Muhammad, of course. And so the head of the Muslim Brotherhood, he says, well, during times of war, the Prophet Muhammad, he would use catapults. And these catapults had big rocks in them, and when they were shot off, they would indiscriminately hurt people. And so he said, because the Prophet Muhammad did this during times of war to defend the faith, in modern warfare, you can use these mortars and shells in order to do the same thing. It is okay to indiscriminately hurt people when you are defending the faith. The Sham heard that, and he was like, hmm, all right, well, that makes sense. And the guy looked at him, he said, you know, you're a smart kid. I think you should study the Quran more than you have, and we want to make you part of our leadership. He was like, that's cool. So he goes, he starts studying the Quran intensely, and six months later, he's invited to preach the Friday sermon at his mosque. Now, that's a big, big honor. It'd be like preaching up here on Sunday morning for Christians. And particularly for being someone so young, that's a big deal. So he's 16 years old at this point. He's ready to preach this sermon, but he doesn't get there. Because a few days before he's scheduled to preach, he gets in this big car accident. He breaks both of his legs with multiple fractures. And he ends up going to the American University Medical Center in Beirut. While he's there, for the first time in his life, he's exposed to doctors and nurses and how they're caring for everyone. And he was really, really struck by this. And he was there for some, <clears throat> something close to 70 days. And at the end of that 70 day period, he decided, you know what, I want to be a doctor. I want to care for people like they are. So he leaves, he applies to the American University in Beirut, he gets accepted, and he starts to study biology. During the first semester of his freshman year, he receives word from his mother that his older brother, this is his only sibling, was killed by a Christian militia. Now, understandably, he was pretty upset about this. In fact, he was enraged, and he wanted revenge. So what he decided to do was, he went out, he purchased a gun, a silencer, and he purchased ammunition. And what he did was, he started stalking the victims, the people who had killed his brother. Every night, 
he would go and he would watch these people where they went. When they came out of church, at their homes, he would watch them as they went to the store and as they would visit their family. He tracked all of their movements because his goal was to kill these people in mass one night, murder all of them at once. So, during the day, he's this student studying biology. And at night, he's plotting this horrific massacre. Well, it just so happens that one of the courses he was required to take when he was at the American University in Beirut was a world religions course. And during this course, they would hand out different scriptures from various religions around the world. And the one part of the Christian religion that was copied is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Now, you may have heard that reference before. But essentially, the Sermon on the Mount is a section from the Gospel of Matthew. It's two chapters. It's arguably two of the most important chapters in the entire New Testament. If you've never read anything from the Bible before, those two chapters are worth reading. It's Matthews 5 and 6. It's in those chapters that he read things like, when someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And when Jesus says, you have heard it said that you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. So Hisham, he reads this for the first time. And he's really taken aback by it. Because... He has never seen anything like this before. And at first he dismisses it completely because he feels that these teachings, they are not possible for humans to actually follow. So he just says, you know what, this is ridiculous. But at night, while he's out stalking his victims, he can't get these verses out of his mind. He keeps thinking about them over and over again until the point where he decides that he's going to read the New Testament for himself, because he wants to know, who is this Jesus guy really? And as he reads the New Testament, he comes to a conclusion that God is calling him to a different kind of life. Eventually, he abandons his plans to murder this Christian militia, and he starts attending church services. Now, he's the kind of guy, he sneaks in after the church service has started, and he leaves before the church service is ended. I know we don't have anybody like that in here, right? They would never do anything like that. You never want to be anonymous and not be seen. But that's what he did. And he did that for seven years until he decided that he was going to abandon his Islamic identity completely and become a Christian. Now, you have to realize that that's not like what it means over here in the U.S., where people can just flip religions all the time. His last name is Shahab. Shahab traces its family origin all the way back to the Prophet Muhammad. So if you're a Shahab, you're a Muslim, not a Christian. And the fact that he decided that he was going to jump like this, people thought he was crazy. His family really was not too keen on this, and eventually he started to be persecuted by different people in his area. Until the point where he decided, you know what, i got to leave. He abandoned his family, his friends, and he immigrated to the United States. And he went to seminary. And today, he is a Lutheran pastor in the city of Chicago. Not too far away from where we are right now. Now, why have I taken all this time to tell you about Hisham Shahab? Because I think there are some major parallels between his story and Abraham's story. Follow me on this. So both Hisham and Abraham, they both believed that God had justified their intentions to hurt other people. And both men heard God calling out to them before they could complete the act. Both men said to God, here I am. Both Hisham and Abraham, they heard God's voice and they realized that what they believed God was calling them to do was very different from what God actually wanted them to do. And I think this is true in all of our lives. This is the way that Hisham, Abraham, and us all come together. I think everybody in here, we believe, we know what God wants us to do. 
But the reality is, is that what God wants from us is very different from what we believe God wants us to do. They are two very different things. I began this sermon by telling you that the point today is to talk about those tough circumstances, those tough situations where you're trying to determine are you going to make the right decision, the decision that God would have you make? And I explained to you that the way you can sometimes tell this is by the consequences of your actions, right? When you make a decision, how do those decisions impact other people? This is also known as the ripple effect. Have you ever heard about that before, the concept of the ripple effect? So you make a decision, and that decision, it ripples out beyond you to other people. So when you make a positive choice, a positive decision, then that positivity is going to hit other people in positive ways. Likewise, when you make a negative decision, it ripples out in negative ways to affect other people. Now here's the point I need you to take away, because this, this is key. There are very, very few people who actually consider the ripples of how their decisions affect other people. The vast majority of us, we make decisions based on our own self-interest, even if we know a decision we are going to make will hurt someone else, we will make it in spite of the consequences. And we will justify it in our own minds, and sometimes we will justify it by saying that God is the one who told me to do it. So, in Asham's case, right, he wanted to revenge his brother's death by killing this Christian militia. And he believed that God totally justified what he was doing. Likewise, Abraham, he was going to kill his son to prove his worthiness to God. Again, very clearly, he believed God wanted him to do it. Both men were willing to take life to serve their own self-interest. But thankfully, God is always trying to make us reflect before we act. God is always speaking to us, trying to help us to think about how our words and how our actions are going to impact the people around us. Indeed, I will tell you, I personally believe that God is always whispering in our ear, trying to help us minimize those negative ripples in our lives. Now, in Hisham's case, he heard God so clearly that he ended up saving the lives of dozens of people. Dozens of people. And the truth is, you may not believe me when I say this, but I absolutely believe this. You have the potential to save lives as well when you listen for God's calling in your life. There are people who you cross paths with every single day who are suffering and struggling and in need of those positive ripples in their lives. There are people who you see every single day whose lives have been so overwhelmed by negative ripples that they are on the brink of giving up on life. But you, if you are listening to what God is saying to you, you can change that. I want you to think about this for a second. Every day, you get up and you leave your house. And there are people who you come across all the time because they have the same patterns that you have. You see them on your way to work. Maybe you're on the train when you see them there. Maybe you see them when you go to the grocery store. Maybe you see them in restaurants or at coffee bars. Maybe you see them in school when you're walking down the hallway. The truth is, you see people all the time in your life, and we choose to ignore them. And these are people who God is calling out to you to say to them, here I am. I can tell you that some of the most important conversations I have had in my life are to people who I have taken the time to just stop and speak with, who I normally would never say a word to. And they have come back to me years later and said, you know what, at the time that you spoke to me, I was going through a really tough time, and the fact that you listened to me with a compassionate ear, it made a huge difference in my life. The truth is, there are people all around you who are in need of those positive ripples, and you can be that person to them if you are willing to listen and say, here I am. Now, in two weeks, we're going to talk more about this concept. We're going to get deeper into this. Next week is Barbara's last sermon. So I hope you'll be here for that, because that's going to be a great sermon. She's been working really hard on it. It's going to be a sad time. But 
It's our last sermon. So two weeks from now, we're going to come back to this ripple concept, and we're going to get really deep into it and how influential it can be and how it can affect your life for good and for evil. But in the meantime, here's what I want you to do in the next two weeks till we come back together. I want you to look for those moments where there might be somebody who you could speak to and who you could have that positive influence on because they are out there. They are all around you. And you have that potential. But you have to be willing to say, here I am. Amen.